because neither one's a person, the same reasons that would justify abortion would also justify post-birth abortion or infanticide. So this argument was put forward most famously by uh, a pair of bioethicists named um, Gio Bellini and Minerva. And what they said was basically that until a human being is aware that she exists and desires to continue existing until those two conditions are met, the human being in question is not a person and therefore doesn't have a right to life and therefore the parents can end that child's life. Now you might ask yourself, well, when do these two characteristics come into existence? Namely, when is it that human beings realize they're alive and value their own existence? Well, psychologists point to something called the mirror test to determine whether a human being has um, a self-awareness. And the mirror test is basically, uh, if you put a little dot or a little cross on, on a child's forehead and they look in a mirror, do they recognize that as themselves or do they think it's another child? So think about a dog seeing in a mirror another itself will think it's another dog. And little kids, like one-year-olds, if they see their own image in a mirror with a little mark on their head, they think it's another child. But once you have self-awareness, which for human beings comes around the age of two, then you look in the mirror and you say, aha, that's me. And you say, well, you know, why is, this there, why is there a mark on my head? So for human beings, on average, it's around the age of two that you gain self-awareness and you realize that you exist. And so if their view is correct, what you'd say is that post-birth abortion or infanticide or killing of children ought to be permissible until about the age of two. So for some children, maybe younger, maybe they're, they're self-aware, you know, uh, one year and nine months or something. Other children, developmentally delayed children, might not be self-aware until three or four or five or six, but basically for most human beings around the age of two. I think that is uh, a reductio ad absurdum. I think that's an absurd conclusion. So that's one of the reasons I reject their view. But there's lots of other reasons to reject their view too. And, and I think maybe the most prominent is this idea that they have, that in order to be harmed, you have to experience this as a harm. In other words, in order for you or I to be harmed, the idea is we have to value whatever it is in question and value the harm that comes to us if we lose that. So like, think of my watch. I have this watch on and I value my watch. So if someone steals my watch, well, then I'm harmed. And I experienced that as a harm. But if I didn't know I had a watch and someone took my watch, I wouldn't you know, be harmed because I wouldn't experience that as a harm. So I don't think that argument works very well for a number of reasons. Um, first is that there's many ways we can be harmed and yet we don't experience it as a harm. So let me give you an example. If a nuclear bomb were to go off right now where I'm sitting, um, I would be completely pulverized. I would instantly, you know, be a bunch of atoms and molecules. So it would happen so fast, uh, you know, the speed of light that I wouldn't experience that as a harm. I just go from talking to you and feeling fine to just not existing anymore. But it seems very obvious that if you kill me in a pain, a painless and instant way like that, it's clearly true that you harm me. So that means it's not necessary for me to experience something as a harm for me to actually be harmed. Or to take a different example, if you uh, did a lobotomy on a uh, one-year-old child and made it so that their mind never developed past the age of one, um, did you harm the child? I think clearly you did. Did the child experience it as a harm? Did the child say, oh my gosh, you scrambled my brains, now I'm harmed? No. So you can harm someone even though they don't experience it as a harm. So their account, I think, really doesn't, doesn't work very well. Um, here's another, another um, yeah. So, so I think there's a bunch of reasons that we should reject their account, but those are just a couple of them. In my book, I talk about a lot more reasons to reject it, but just for the sake of time, we'll stick with just a couple. What if they said, if you, you were blown up by the nuclear bomb, you know, yeah. you, you aren't harmed because you're not experiencing it. Um, and, but it's only maybe the, the people who, who would miss you that are harmed, and, but you actually aren't harmed. Yeah. So if you kill like a homeless guy in a quick and painless way, and no one's going to miss the homeless guy because his family, you know, is not in contact with him, then you've harmed no one. Yeah. Is that, I mean, is that the, or, or if you destroy everyone on planet earth, 
since there'll be no one around to miss you, you haven't harmed anyone. So as long as you kill enough people, you don't harm anyone. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of what it seems like. Yeah, the that, seems, that seems hard to believe to me, at least that killing everyone on Earth would count as no harm to anyone on Earth. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't really work. Uh, yeah, I don't think it works. Well. I don't think it works. There's other problems with our view too. So, just one more problem I'll mention is, according to Giablini and Minerva, you quote unquote, you only come to existence at around the age of two. And the reason they hold that is that what you are, according to them, is your thoughts, beliefs, desires, etc. So they have this view of the person that that is sometimes called body self dualism. So the real me is my thoughts, beliefs, desires, etc. The real you are your thoughts, beliefs, desires, etc. But like my flesh and blood, my body, that's not really me at all. It's a little bit like a vehicle I'm driving around in. So if someone you know throws an egg at my car, well, they didn't really harm me. They just harmed my car. Now, I reject that kind of anthropology. I think that's that's confused and, and doesn't work well at all to explain the reality of who we are as humans. And this example might help clarify it. So imagine I have multiple personality syndrome. So there's there's sometimes I'm Christopher Kayser, philosophy professor. Sometimes I'm Hoist Gracie, the jujitsu master. Sometimes I'm Jacques, uh, the French chef. And imagine these are just two or three totally different personalities, right? One only speaks Portuguese, one only speaks French, and then I only speak English. Um, and let's say you're a doctor and you come along and say, I'm gonna cure you. And so you give me the psychological or the psychiatric treatment. And now my personal multiple personality door order goes away. Jacques is gone, Hoist, the jujitsu guy is gone. All that's left is Chris. Well, my way of viewing that would be to say that you've cured me. But if you took this body self dualism view seriously, you'd have to say, well, you destroyed mm. two persons. You destroyed Jacques, you destroyed Hoy. So you should be charged with murder, double murder, actually. Yeah. Well, it seems. What was that? I was just, it seems like that that is the uh, pervasive view of who we are as human beings that's uh, certainly appearing in the media, for example, or that's that's, right. it's all over TikTok. Yeah, that's actually, right. That's they are right. having these multiple personality TikTok, you know, celebrities that are flaunting these, um, these personalities like that and saying, this right. is who I am. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is, um, you know, with real multiple personality disorder, it is a disorder, right? In other words, and the idea isn't just that, in other words, what I, I do, I'm not meaning this, I'm not meaning that each one of us as an individual acts or behaves in different contexts in different ways mm -hmm. right because if you go play softball it is time to play softball it's not time to do your taxes when you're on second base or something so yes we have different parts of ourselves that we use or, or reveal at different times that that's perfectly normal what i'm talking about is someone who has three different personalities such that jacques doesn't even know chris exists hoist mm -hmm. doesn't know jacques exists and these you know they're they there's three independent lines of memory thought, belief, desire, no integration. Whereas in a real person, yeah, you might be on stage one, one day singing a song and then the next day you're you're doing gardening and the next day you're, um, you're doing a podcast. But I mean, you in all three contexts are aware of the other ways you're expressing yourself at different times and places. So you don't have multiple personality disorder. Um, and I do think that that it's why they recognize it as a disorder. But here's another reason to think that this whole view, this body self dualism view is problematic. Um, many actions we do, if you say, well, I taste the sandwich I ate, or I see the sandwich that I'm about to eat, or I smell the sandwich that I'm eating, that involves our senses, right? There's no such thing as seeing unless you have eyes. There's no such thing as tasting unless you have a mouth. There's no smelling without a nose. So to do those activities, you need a body. So if I say, I see, the cup. Well, that I need a body to see because I need eyes and an ocular nerve, etc. And then with thinking, you say, well, I think that this cup is going to be filled with water and it's good for me to drink the water. But it's the very same eye that sees mm -hmm. that also is thinking about it. So the idea is somehow that I am not a body or that I'm just this mind or just this thought is is incompatible with the reality that I see things, I taste things, I touch things. That, those are all bodily acts. 
So I don't think this body self dualism view uh, really at the end of the day is very philosophical.